there's an outline of what I'll be saying on the inside of the sheet you got and, and today. And I uh, just want to say thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak in this series. It's been great. Uh, I think it's been encouraging for me to reflect on what the Bible has to say about relationships. I hope it's been encouraging and helpful for you as well. As we've uh, thought about relationships, the basic idea that we've been considering is that Jesus of Nazareth brought kind of revolution in thinking about relationships. That when Christianity came and emerged into the ancient world, it brought a whole different way of thinking about relationships, about the priority of relationships and about the conduct of relationships. There was a revolution in thinking about the priority of relationships because Christianity said that human beings are made for a relationship and that, in fact, God, who is at the centre of the universe, who made all things, is himself a relationship of three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that put that emphasis very much on relationships, said that life is about relationships and that you should major on relationships in your life, that to be truly human is to be a person in relationship with others. It's not about being an individual, it's not about being separate or autonomous from others, it's about being a person in relationship with others. There was also a revolution in thinking about how to conduct relationships, and that's particularly what we've been thinking about, that the uh, idea is that uh, relationships, relating to others is basically about an attitude of service to others. So what it means to relate properly to others and what it means to love other people is to serve them, to serve them at your own cost, to be a person who's focused on others rather than on yourself. And that does, I think, amount to a revolution. Not an easy revolution to put into practice, of course, but certainly one that uh, is a very different way of looking at life and a very different way of looking at relating to others. And so we've seen that work out in a number of ways with regards to friendship. So the way to be a great friend is to lay down your life for your friend, to serve your friends. Uh, in regards to sex, we've seen the way that it leads to an attitude uh, to do with sex, which is about serving someone else and being united to them. Uh, we've seen the way that it plays out with regard to marriage, understanding marriage as a radical commitment to another person and radical service of another person. But what about when relationships let you down? And that's what we're, what we're going to look at today. What about when relationships let you down? Because they will let you down, and they do let you down, and uh, that's why the topic isn't uh, if relationships let you down. I can say with certainty that you either have been let down by relationships or you will be in the future. And some of you, I know, bear very deep hurts from relationships, that there's considerable disappointment in your life already, and that it's a burden for you to live with. Uh, others of you, uh, uh, I think, will experience that in the future in various ways, and we'll think a bit about why that is uh, later on. So it's a really important topic, it's a really significant one, and how you respond to the disappointments in your life, how you respond to letdowns in relationships in your life is a really crucial question for who you are and what's going to happen in your life. And what I want to do is just to attempt to briefly outline some ways in which uh, you can think about these things and you can respond to these things, some broad categories that I think are helpful to think in. So obviously um, we could go into a great deal of detail and we could have a whole series on various kinds of ways of addressing problems in relationships. Uh, but today, I just really want to introduce that, uh, some key ideas for you. The first thing uh, is to do with expectations and relationships. And there's two areas that I just want us to think about here that I think are really important. Uh, the first one is to do with idolatry. And you may not have kind of thought about this category in relation to relationships, but I think it's a really significant one. Uh, idolatry is when we put something else in God's place. But if you put anything else in the place of God, that's idolatry. And uh, the Bible teaches us that we were made for a relationship with God, that the primary relationship in our lives is meant to be a relationship with God, and that ultimately we were made for a perfect relationship with the perfect God. But when we 
substitute something else for God, uh, there are a number of results. That's obviously something that's a problem in itself, a problem for our relationship with God. But it's also a problem in terms of whatever we put in place of God. Uh, and we actually see that reflected in the Bible in a number of ways. I just want to share with you some words, first of all, from the prophet Jeremiah. And here Jeremiah is talking about the idolatry of the people of Israel and reflecting on what the people have done. And this is what he says. He uses a, a metaphor to talk about what idolatry is like. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. The problem here is not just that the people of Israel have forsaken God, that is a problem in itself, but also that the substitute that they have for God doesn't work. The substitute that they have for God, creating other gods for themselves, putting other things in the place of God, actually is a failure. God is pictured here as being like a fountain, a fountain that can satisfy all their thirst, all their need. But instead they dig holes for themselves, cisterns in the ground designed to hold water, but they're broken. They don't work, they don't gather water. And so the people, even though they're trying to get the satisfaction, even though they're trying to get the water, are un unable to get any. They've forsaken God who is like a fountain and they end up with nothing. And uh, that, this is the, the second problem with idolatry. Not just the rejection of God, which is bad enough, but the experience of trying to put something else in the place of God and finding that that other thing does not satisfy. Finding that that other thing doesn't work for you. And very often the thing that people place in the place of God is relationships. That is, we... Uh, we set aside a relationship with God and we try to fill the void with other relationships. Uh, and it might be of various kinds of relationships. It might be friendships, it might be romantic relationships, it might be marriage, it might be a relationship with children. It's very common for people to try to substitute relationship with God uh, with one of these other kinds of relationships in our lives. And you would know, you would be able to tell if you were doing that if you were thinking in this kind of way. If only I was married to such and such, everything would be okay. If only I was friends with so and so, then everything would be alright in my life. Or, to put it slightly differently, uh, if I were to lose this person, if I were to lose them, then basically my life would be over. Whenever someone thinks of their significance coming from some other relationship, thinks of their identity in terms of some other relationship, then that's a kind of idolatry of relationships. And the thing about that, those relationships is they will always let you down. They will never satisfy you because they will never be able to take the place of God. And that person or those people will never be able to bear the weight that you're putting on them. To be your God. To be your God. Um, and so, you, you can imagine, you, you would never walk up to someone and say, uh, I'm just wondering if you would please be my God for me. Um, that would be ridiculous. That would be ridiculous. And yet, somehow that is what we do to people. We expect so much from them. We expect a relationship with them to be so significant and so fulfilling and so excellent that we are in practice actually putting them in the place of God. And so there's a danger with that kind of idolatry which leads to disappointment in relationships. There's an inevitable disappointment that comes from it because you're asking too much from a person. You're asking too much from a human being, especially a, a fallen, weak human being like yourself. So, not being an idolater, getting your relationship with God right and having your, a relationship with God at the centre of your life is actually very helpful for our expectations in relationships. It means we are not expecting so much from the people around us. And it means that we uh, actually 
uh, learning from God through relationship with God how to relate well to other people as well. That is, when you know God and you know Jesus, His Son, you, uh, as we've seen in previous weeks, you start to learn what it is to be in relationship with other people, how to serve them with your life. Um, and so, as you learn to do that, uh, disappointment with others is less and less a factor in your relationship, I think, because you're not placing that burden on them. So it's worth, I think, thinking about what you, uh, what you worship, what, what is in the place of God in your life, and how that's affecting your relationships with others. I think that's a key question. A second issue about expectations has to do with forbearance. And uh, this is about your expectations of others. Now, in a way, it's, it's, it makes sense to have high expectations of relationships if what I've said is true. That is, if we were made for relationships, then, you know, we have fairly, it's reasonable to have fairly high expectations of them, that we will find them fulfilling, that we will find them helpful, that we will, that we will love being in relationships with other people. So high expectations make a kind of sense. But we need to remember uh, what human beings are really like in terms of our expectations of relationships. That is, Christian view is that human beings are fallen. That human beings are not what we were meant to be. That human beings exist in a state of perpetual rebellion against God and that that affects our humanity in various ways. And that because of that, we are naturally selfish, we are naturally fall fallible, uh, we are naturally uh, unable to treat, each, to, to treat others in the way that they deserve to be treated. We are incapable of perfection, we are disposed to be selfish, and we are unclear on what the right thing to do is. We are unclear about right and wrong. And that means that any relationship with another human being is going to let you down. People are always going to let you down. Every relationship is going to let you down. Uh, what that means, I think, is knowing that all people are like that uh, means that we're not going to waste our time trying to find someone who won't let us down. It is a waste of time. And we're going to have an attitude to each other of forbearance. Do you know what that word means? It's an attitude to someone else where you allow for their weakness, where you allow for their sinfulness, where you allow for the fact that, like you, they are a fallen person. And so what that allows you to do, actually, is to not take offence at every single thing that the person does wrong. To not take offence at the kind of things that people say or do, especially when it's accidental. And this is happening all the time. If you are like me, even sometimes when you're trying to help someone, you're trying to say the right thing, you're trying to be good and helpful, even then you still hurt them by the things you say and do. Is it just me? Maybe. No. Uh, and so, uh, knowing that others are fallen in this way actually uh, requires of us an attitude of being slow to get angry with them, slow to take offence at the things that they do. And in doing that, uh, we would just be imitating God. Uh, again and again, the Bible says that God is slow to anger. I've got an example there for you, Nehemiah chapter 9. He describes God as a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God is slow to anger. And uh, human beings who are wise and who understand what human beings are like are also, therefore, slow to anger. In the Proverbs, being slow to anger is recommended repeatedly. So, for example, Proverbs 19.11 those with good sense are slow to anger, and it is their glory to overlook an offence. But actually part of being a wise person in the way that you deal with others is that you are slow to get angry with them, and the Bible says actually glorious, the glorious thing, <coughs> the ways that other people offend you, the ways that others offend you. So ex expectations have something to do with uh, the hurt, that we experience in relationships and our response to it. 
and learning to not take offence, learning to be slow to anger is a really important part of dealing with this issue, not taking offence at every opportunity. Uh, there was recently a, a, a survey done to try and work out why happily married couples continue to be happily married year after year. So they interviewed people who had long, happy marriages, and the thing that they found was that uh, the happily married couples uh, could not see each other's faults. This was the thing that they found. They were blind to each other's faults. And when asked, you know, what's wrong with the person you're married to? Nothing, really. Uh, now, I think it wasn't really that they didn't know, but it was just that they had learned to be forbearing. They, was, they were slow to take offence. They actually just got to the point where they didn't mind some of the things about the other person uh, because they had this kind of attitude. So I think there's wisdom for relationships in that. Okay, well, what about when relationships let you down? Really what we're saying here is what about when people let you down? When people let you down. It's not relationships themselves. Let's be clear, it's people who let us down. And what should we do? What should we think about them? Well, uh, the first and most important thing is about forgiveness. And uh, here I'm drawing on Jesus' teaching uh, and what he said to his disciples about this. Uh, Jesus taught the disciples, his followers, how to relate to each other. He envisaged them being a new community of people together. And he taught them how they should treat each other. And uh, this is one of the things he said in Luke chapter 17. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. Uh, Jesus says, first of all, if someone does something wrong to you, it's, it's good and it's fine to confront them about it. To say to them, you've done the wrong thing by me. And to let them know that they've done something wrong. That there is a problem in the relationship now because of their actions or their words. Uh, so it's, it's fine to confront them and to rebuke them. Jesus says, if they listen to you and if they repent and they turn back, if they acknowledge that they've done the wrong thing and say, I didn't, I didn't want to do that, I don't want to, I don't want to treat you that way, if they say that to you, then you need, Jesus says, to forgive them. You must forgive them, he says. That is, you must say to them, I no longer hold this against you. I no longer have anything over you. Uh, we are clear with each other. We are fine in terms of our relationship together. The Apostle Paul built on Jesus' words in what he wrote, wrote to the Colossians, and I've printed that there as well for you. He says, Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. It's a community of people who follow Jesus is meant to be a community of peace and a community of love. <coughs> to be that, it needs to be also be a community of forgiveness. And the rationale for forgiveness, the reason that lies behind it, Paul says, is because we ourselves have been forgiven. And this is absolutely crucial. That the, the starting point of forgiveness is the way that God forgives us. God forgives us for our idolatry. God forgives us for putting some other things in His place. He's, he cancels our debt. He says that we are okay with Him because of Jesus. And so God has acted to forgive us. He takes the initiative to forgive us. And so He expects that we will then be able to forgive others for the wrong things that they do to us. To follow God's example and forgive those who have done the wrong thing to us. In fact, he goes on, uh, Jesus says, look, really, you can't expect God to forgive you if you are unwilling to forgive other people. So there will always be sins, there will always be reasons for complaint, there will always be problems in our community. And the question really is, how is that going to get fixed up? How is that going to get restored? And uh, the answer is that it must be restored through confrontation and repentance and forgiveness. So when someone does wrong to you, you must be willing to confront them. They must be willing to listen to 
to you and repent, and you must be willing to forgive them. Now, uh, it has to be said that this is a difficult thing and a really costly thing. To forgive someone is really costly. It's much easier, actually, to hold a grudge or to get revenge or to be grumpy and angry and bitter and all of those things. That's easier than forgiving. It's easier to run away and avoid the issue, to give up on the relationship and just walk away than it is to confront someone or forgive someone. Those are easier options, and that's why people so often take them. But forgiveness actually means absorbing the pain of what's happened to yourself. Not getting revenge, not holding something against someone, but actually experiencing the pain of it yourself, absorbing the pain of it yourself. And uh, this is what it means for God to forgive us, and it's what it means for us to forgive others. So what we see God doing in sending Jesus and Jesus dying on the cross is that God actually is taking the pain of what we have done onto himself, the cost of what we have done onto himself. Rather than responding to what we've done with vengeance, God actually absorbs the cost to himself. And in some kind of similar way, so we are not God, when we forgive others, we, we are taking the cost on ourselves. It's worth recognising that and saying, yes, it's really hard, but this is what God has, himself has done, and this is what God calls us to as well. A great story of someone doing this uh, from the last century is the story of <coughs> Corrie Ten Boom in her book, The Hiding Place. And I think uh, I mentioned this to some of you before, but it's worth sharing again. Uh, you may know her, sto her story. She was a Dutch woman. She was living uh, in the Second World War under German occupation, and her family <coughs> hid some Jews uh, in her house uh, to keep them safe from the Nazi regime. And uh, they were discovered and found out, and she and her father and her sister were all sent to prison, first of all, and then to concentration camps. Her father died in the prison, and her beloved sister Betsy died in the concentration camp at Ravensbrook. And eventually Corrie herself survived and was released and survived the war. Uh, she was uh, a Christian, uh, committed to living God's way. And uh, after the war she went around teaching about her experiences and the need for reconciliation and forgiveness. She writes about how once, a couple of years after the war in 1947, she was speaking in Munich in Germany and a man approached her through the crowd and she recognised him. Uh, let me read to you what she says about what happened. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a grey overcoat, a brown felt hat, clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken. It was 1947 and I had come from Poland to defeat Germany with a message that God forgives. And that's when I saw him, working his way towards forward against the other. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back to me in a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp, where we were sent. He said, you mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, his hand came out, Fraulein, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had every day to be forgiven, and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, 
but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who've injured us. And I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion, I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of will, and the will can still function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I pray silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang out to our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Uh, the call to forgiveness is a deeply costly thing. It means renouncing the right to revenge. It means renouncing the right to hold something over someone. And that, uh, but it's absolutely worth doing, as Corey makes clear. Well, just briefly, a couple of more things uh, about when relationships let us down. First of all, about justice and the desire for vengeance. You might think, well, what if someone does something terrible to me, but they don't repent? They don't repent. They don't acknowledge what they've done. They may even be happy about it and glory in it. What do you do then? You want revenge. You want to pay them back. Well, Jesus' teaching is not to take revenge. Jesus' teaching is it's dangerous to actually want to try and pay someone back. It's not that the feeling is wrong, it's not that the desire for justice is wrong, but there's something actually unhelpful about human beings getting vengeance. This is what uh, Paul says as he picks up on Jesus' teaching. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Jesus teaches and the apostles teach that what you should do if you want vengeance is to leave it to God. If you feel like you want revenge, if you feel you want, like you want payback, you need to leave it with God. The reason is because vengeance belongs to God and he will bring real and true justice. If, when we bring justice, when we try and bring justice ourselves, we actually do it in an un unhelpful way. Our justice is inaccurate, it's blunt, it's unhelpful. It often leads to others being hurt uh, in a way uh, that's out of control and can often start cycles of vengeance rather than leading to peace. Uh, the recent movie True Grit, uh, you might have seen it, fantastic, fantastic film. It's about uh, a western about a girl, 14 years old, called Mackie, and she, uh, her, 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 her father is murdered, and she sets out for revenge. And she, the story is great because she is absolutely relentless in her pursuit of vengeance against those who killed her father. But the thing is, along the way, lots of people get killed. Lots of people get hurt. And she gets her vengeance, but she ends up, as she describes herself, as a cranky old maid with one arm. <laughs> <laughs> she is literally at the end less than the human being she was before. She is literally at the end an unbalanced person. Because of her relentless, relentless pursuit of vengeance uh, at, at the expense of everything else in her life. Uh, Jesus says, let God be the one to avenge you. Uh, don't seek vengeance yourself. Finally, healing. Uh, this is very significant in terms of uh, our thinking about this. When relationships let you down, uh, there's often pain that comes out of it. Uh, and God promises that he will heal the pain that we experience in relationships. But uh, some of our hurts heal over time in a natural kind of way. Some of our hurts may be healed 
supernaturally, if you like, in this life now. But there are some hurts that, uh, that don't heal. And you may remember in uh, Tolkien's magnificent commentary on the Bible, The Lord of the Rings, uh, <laughs> that there is Frodo is wounded in many ways uh, in, his, in his quest. But there is one wound that doesn't heal. Remember this? There's a wound that doesn't heal. And ultimately, it's not, it can't be healed without him going away to the undying lands and finding healing there. It's a way of saying there are wounds in our life which, which do not heal, but can only be healed in eternity by God uh, when we are with him forever. And this is the promise of the Bible, that uh, God will heal our wounds. God will heal our wounds. Let me read you these words from Revelation. Here is an image, here is a vision of the final state of things when people live with God. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Later it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life Right as a river flowing from the throne of God in the land through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit in each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. It may be in your life that you have to bear many, many hurts from other people, but God's promise is that you will be healed of your hurts, that every tear will be wiped away when you are with Him. So there's not a promise from God that you won't be hurt if you live His way. Jesus treated other people perfectly well, and yet others hurt Him. But the call is not to give up on relationships, but actually to take the risk of loving others, and to take the pain of being hurt, and to look forward to that day when your pain and your hurts will be healed. I'm not sure we're going to have time for questions. Let's just have a little break. And you might like to fill in a communication card. And let me get a drink and we'll see if there's any time for questions at all. Thank you. 